Hi there guys, it's Mike from MCQ Bushcraft here and welcome to episode 11 of Bushcraft Basics. In last week's episode we had a brief look at UK knife law, really just to give people a bit of an understanding of uh, the laws and how they can carry these tools in the field if they wish to use them. But in this week's episode we're going to be having a look at a variety of basic bushcraft knives and talking about a few others as well that are out there for sale that are really perfect for people who are starting bushcraft and are looking to purchase their, their first bushcraft knife to use in the field. But before we have a look at any specific products, I'm just gonna show you a couple of the knives that I own and really just familiarize ourselves with the anatomy of a bushcraft knife so that you can really understand what you're looking at and see the subtle differences in between designs. So these are two knives here that I use when I'm practicing bushcraft skills. Just here we have a Jack Law Classic and here we have a forest bushcraft four inch knife and we'll start with this one here. So if we look at this knife here we can start to get a very good example of what anatomy makes up a knife and start to see how it's constructed. We can see that this portion here is the blade which is fairly obvious. This is the actual blade of the knife and this is four inches long which is about standard for a bushcraft camp knife. We can see that the actual metal that makes up the blade of the knife continues on through the handle just here and this part is called the tang and you can visibly see the tang on this knife and this is often referred to as a full tang so this knife is one large piece of steel that's been turned into a, a knife shape and then two handles have been bolted either side which is often referred to as the scales you can have other designs as well uh, this mora here for example you can't see the actual tang on this one. The tang is actually set and cast into this plastic handle and that's called a push tang or a rat tail tang. But this exposed curisando knife here, you can see that's what the tang would look like in that mora and they're often set into a wooden or plastic handle. The back of the blade here is often referred to as the spine. It is a three mil blade in terms of its thickness which is probably my favourite width of actual blade for using in the field. It's nice and thin, but at the same time it's very strong and um, it allows you to get quite a nice bevel on it. This is a 25 degree Scandinavian grind on it, which is what this type of knife grind is called. A very common grind that you see in bushcraft. And predominantly it's designed for carving wood and this one excels at that. We've got what I would call just there a drop point in the blade. So. On some knives you have a very straight spine and then it drops off very slightly into a drop point. That does make the point a lot stronger. In, even on some blades you can have a tapered spine or a tapered blade for example or, or edge that narrows off as it gets towards the point and that might be quite good for something like a filleting knife or a skinning knife, um, something that requires to go in and then uh, make a very fine cut for example. But on these knives here they're about three mil all the way to the edge where you just start to get to the bevel simply because it makes them a lot stronger for heavier jobs. But this one has quite a pronounced drop point and a, quite a curve in the blade which I really like and that's to really give this point here, this is often referred to as the belly by the way of the blade, this curve here and, and different knives have different bellies on them but if we look at this one here it only has a very slight drop point so the curvature or maneuverability of that point would have to be angled far more like this to get some curvature when carving. But on this one here it can be held quite comfortably like this and you can get a lot of rotation when carving and that's predominantly what this part of the blade will give you. It will give you a lot of rotation and curvature when working with wood where there is that part there will try to bed in more. So when you're feathering this portion here, your primary part of the blade will be very useful for, for getting quite long strokes and cuts down a piece of wood and gauging that thickness as you go down a piece of wood to get a nice curl on a feather. So blade, bevel, primary bevel, belly, we've got a point there, we have a drop point, a spine, we have a finger guard just there, we have the scales, sometimes a handle, we have the tang just there. Other features as well on this essie. Sometimes you have jimping just there to allow your finger to be placed on top so that you can steady the blade for example and gain more control. Occasionally you have a pummel so you can smack things with it and actually crack rocks 
or crack other items with a hardened pummel on the end, even glass. Sometimes survival knives or emergency knives have a point just there for cracking glass if you're in a car accident and you need to break a window. Sometimes you have a choil, and choils traditionally were so that you could sharpen all of the blade on the stone. If you'll notice on this mora here, sharpening all of the blade will mean the plastic will come into contact with the sharpening stone. And that's not specifically a problem because it's a cheap plastic knife, but if you've got a nice wooden one, sometimes it's nice to have that gap so you're not carving into the wood with a sharpening stone and scratching it. So a choil can be useful for that, but in more modern senses that the choil can often be used like this as well. So your finger, and this is quite a shallow choil, so you've got to be careful, but your finger will go in there like that and it'll allow you to create less distance between your hand and the actual blade. So when you're pushing down, you can get a lot more force coming straight down your arm onto the blade instead of that distance, which might allow some leverage in the wrist and fatigue over time. So you do see other features like that as well. If we have a look at this Jack Law Classic, this one's well used. I've been using this for some time, testing it out, and it's a very good blade. But it's more on the, the side of the Woodlaw design, if you look at it. It's uh, got quite a stout blade. It's about 4 mil thick. It's got about a 28 to 30 degree bevel on it. And um, you can see the differences in the actual design. This one's much straighter, less curvature. Got a bit of a straighter spine here but it still drops off into quite a drop point and we have much more curved belly just there so you don't get as much rotation with this one as you do with that and um, you do generally have to angle the knife a bit more to be using that portion of the curve than you do with this knife here that can be um, can be easily used a bit better so this one's specifically designed for carving whether this is a more of an all-round bushcraft knife that you could use in the field and batten with and interestingly enough, we talked about tapered blades and how they taper off thinner. But on this one here, we've actually got a tapered tang to reduce the weight in the handle and balance the knife out a bit more. So um, a little difference there, but really only a subtle one you see in variations of knife design. So hopefully that gave you just a little bit of an understanding of the sort of design features you can see on knives. It's not a complete A to Z on the anatomy of knives, but you don't need to be an expert to practice bushcraft and know how to use them. And this is a basic course and it'll come with time when you're using knives, trying different grinds and seeing how different steels can perform. But that's an interesting thing. And for me, one of the most important features on the knife is the handle. You'll quickly notice when a handle is not comfortable and it doesn't matter how good the blade is if the handle isn't comfortable the knife is effectively useless in my opinion and needs a new handle if you're in the field and you're working with knives for a long time the handle comfort is so essential I like quite a large handle on my knives I like them to sit in the palm quite comfortably and most of the time when I'm working I'll be using the chest lever just like this carving like that using my back muscles and my arms doing a chicken impression in the woods carving away with a piece of wood and that's predominantly how I use a knife most of the time so that curvature on the back of the handle there is quite important to me if I'm using a knife like this this jacklaw here which is a, a more standardized bushcraft knife in some respects in terms of its design you can see it fits in the palm quite completely really going all the way to the end um, it doesn't curve round in any respect. It can still be used very comfortably like that. But what you'll find is that portion there overhangs and it tends to dig in to the actual chest, into the ribs. And when working for prolonged periods of time, that can actually cause some bruising there. So this knife isn't designed completely with carving in mind, although it does have a wood grind and um, a general camp blade in terms of length but it's more of an all-round knife for using in the field for things like batoning, feathering, for doing a bit of carving, for doing a bit of whittling, whether it's this one here is designed for that as well, but predominantly it's, it's, got, it, it's designed by someone who's a carver. The, the chap who designed this, Mark, my friend, he's, he's an excellent carver and he wanted something in the field that was a, a general camp knife that could do carving as well, and this is his creation here. So you can see how different designs are are really biased to different things. There's no, no matter how many times I hear it, I, I just don't believe that there's one knife that will do all jobs. It's just not possible. 
there are knives out there that do a range of jobs very well um, but they'll always fall short in something. Um, a lot of survival knives for example, a bit like the SE6. This knife is geared up for many many different things. It's a full flat with a micro bevel. So this one here, Scandinavian grind, you can see that there, a good grind for wood, I'll give it that. But this one here is a full flat with a micro bevel, so that is a good all round grind. So it will be pretty good on wood, be good on skinning as well, good on heavy processing, it will hold an edge for a long time. It's got a, a much fatter bevel than the Scandi grind. The Scandi grind will be more like that, the grind on the SE will be like that, and then it will taper off to a full flat. So it'll still be able to get some depth, but it has a strong edge at the same time. Um, so this is sort of an all, all more rounds wilderness survival knife in some respects, a bit of a jack of all trades. But coming back to the knife grind, why do a lot of these bushcraft knives have a Scandinavian grind? Well, most of the time when you're out working in the woods, you'll be carving with wood. Whether it be green, whether it be seasoned, you'll be working with wood. And that's predominantly where the Scandinavian grind comes into its own. It's a, an excellent grind for working with wood. Very responsive, you can get very controlled deep cuts at quite shallow angles and really do some fantastic work with working with wood and um, it's a great grind for that. This knife here is a carbon steel knife and it's made of O1 tool steel, the same as the Jacklaw. And very similar as well to the Essie and the Moras that I have with me and the Curasando. All carbon steel knives and you may ask why do a lot of people carry carbon steel knives. They're very forgiving in the field, most carbon steel knives. They have good edge retention. If heat treated properly, they shouldn't chip. But most of the time, they're just quite easy to sharpen. It has a pretty good edge retention. And that's it, they require some looking after. But having a carbon steel or an O1 tool steel with a Scandi grind is quite a good combination in some respects for a standardized knife. Simply because it's quite a big bevel and it requires you to take quite a lot of metal off to sharpen it. Um, not to maintain it, but to actually sharpen it. So if you had a really, really hard steel, quite one of the sort of more modern technologies, it might be quite hard to sharpen a Scandi grind because you have to take a lot of material off. And often you see some of the more cleverer steels or modern technologies used with grinds like this, where not so much metal has to be taken off. So carbon steels and Scandi grinds often go together quite well in the field as knives that are very easy to maintain really. But a Scandi grind predominantly is very good for wood. Um, what it isn't very good for is slicing very thinly like this because it's like a wedge. It's like a wedge design so it's not particularly good at slicing. It would tend to push things apart which is why it's quite good at batoning because it splits and wedges quite well. Although I generally don't use a knife for batoning, a lot of people do, and the Scandi grind can be very good for that, especially one that's 4 mil thick, because that's quite a big wedge. You know, you put that in a piece of wood and you whack it, it's going to split the wood and split it quite easily. There is a full flat, we'll probably go in a lot deeper and a lot more slicier before it starts to pry the wood apart in some respects. Scandi grinds are, are not very good at skinning. Um, and when I say not very good, that they're not the right tool for the job. And I skin a lot of animals. I tend not to use a Scandi grind. Sometimes if I've just got a Scandi on me, I'll use it, obviously. But I'm cautious, I make sure the blade doesn't come into contact with bone. Because in reality, a Scandinavian grind is actually a very fragile grind, it's very delicate. And um, although it's really good for wood, it's not really designed for things like bone and for coming into contact with bone. And if you're filleting a fish and you're ramming it through bone, you will flatten certain areas of the edge, you will roll it. You will see the rolls. When you hold the blade up to the light and turn it like this, you'll see light catching on the actual edge of the blade. And you can feel it as well if you gradually run your finger down. You can feel the rolls in the blade if there are any. In fact, there's a little one just there where I was doing a rabbit the other day and I accidentally just clipped one of the bones by accident. It was the only knife I had on me, so bit of a shame, but something like this would be better, a full flat with a micro bevel, much better for dealing with game with, or even a convex grind as well. But you know, they're designed for different purposes by different people with different things in mind, and um, that's generally the way knives go. They're, they're tools 
for a job and they're generally biased to a specific job but obviously they'll do other things but let's have a look at some other grinds so we talked about a Scandinavian grind and I'll draw the grind for you we're looking at the grinds face on as I draw them it looks a little bit like this it comes down the flat of the blade spine at the top and then it goes in to a bevel like that into the actual blade and these are ground off either side until an edge is formed just here there's no secondary bevel a secondary bevel can be added and it's a good thing to do in the field it makes it easier to sharpen and if you're dressing game and you've got a scandy grind and you know you don't want it to roll you can eliminate rolling very easily and still retain quite a lot of mobility with working with wood and still have quite good performance there by just putting a secondary bevel on but a lot of people don't choose to do that and they like the the performance of that zero grind and it is very responsive when working with wood so that's usually what a scandinavian grind looks like and obviously this bevel can change depending on the thickness of this portion here or uh, you know the actual bevel itself how large they make the bevel uh, manufacturers can can obviously have control of that and you can have control of that later down the line if you want a knife designed for you so if you wanted to have a scandinavian grind with a micro bevel on it it could be something like this and then have a, a smaller bevel just there like that and that would obviously eliminate rolling and make it much stronger and uh, obviously the responsiveness on carving might not be there but you have other grinds as well like a full flat full flat usually goes down like this this is like the SE and you have a, mic a micro bevel or a secondary bevel at the end like that and that's a very slicey grind but a strong one and you see that on a lot of survival knives you have a full flat and it goes into a secondary bevel there and that can penetrate quite deep but still have quite a strong edge you can have other ones as well that are often not, not quite as pronounced so they might have a flat of the knife just there with a smaller bevel just at the end and uh, you generally get a portion of flatness just there um, the variations do change and there are a lot of different names for these grinds but we won't go into them in this video because it all gets a bit much but, but one of the most common ones and, and one that's quite useful for skinning or filleting is a hollow grind and as far as manufacturing goes it's one of the most common leaves because it's quite cheap to produce a hollow grind is put on a large wheel and you get like a curvature on the actual bevel and then a micro bevel at the end you very rarely see these kind of knives like a scandi which is a zero ground so just two grinds to make an edge there you usually have secondary bevels on them or else they'd be very very weak in some respects unless they're specifically aimed at, at certain jobs but a lot of the ones in the bushcraft and survival realm will be secondary beveled just for strength because they know what people will be using these knives for effectively so there are a lot of different grinds and they're really suited for different jobs but you also have a convex grind as well which you'll often find on your axe but that's enough talk we've gone over some of the basics hopefully you've got a bit of an understanding there but let's have a look at some specific knives so this is the knife i would recommend for people beginning bushcraft a mora companion heavy duty mg this probably came as no surprise, mores are often recommended for people who are beginning bushcraft. But there's a reason why. This knife is inexpensive, it comes in at about £15 and around about $16 in the US if you're looking on sites like eBay. And Mora have or use a very very good steel, they use a very good stainless steel, they use a very good carbon steel and their heat treat is really excellent they have a very very good heat treat and for such a little amount of money you're getting an excellent blade and um, this kind of blade quality is is you know it's the equivalent to, to the same of what I'm I've got on this handmade knife here the blade quality the quality of the steel the heat treat the grind you're getting the same thing but on a less expensive knife it's simply bushed because this is handmade and it comes with you know someone hand making it hand finishing it putting scales on gluing it all together you know the process of making the leather sheath that's what puts the cost on these handmade knives the steel is the same as this here the quality is just the same and this is such an excellent knife I would recommend this over the clipper the more a clipper has a tang 
that finishes about there. Remember we talked about tangs earlier. So this is what the tang will look like, something like this in this handle. But the Mora Clipper is about that long. Very, very short tang. In fact, I'm being a bit harsh there. It's probably about that long. The one in this one, the more heavy duty, um, comes with a significantly longer tang. So it ends about there in the knife. So it's about that long. Much longer tang in this one. They do even state on the website that uh, it's designed for things like battening. It's much more heavy duty for tougher jobs because the clipper has is, is got such a shorter tang on it. I've never seen many fail mine saying that. I've not seen many fail. And we've talked about full tangs. You, you, you don't need a full tang unless you're doing really heavy jobs like battening. I don't really even need a full tang. I use my axe to process almost everything while I'm out in the field and um, ideally I could be having this knife just here and get on absolutely fine with it but um, it's just through meeting knife makers over time and doing bushcraft for a long time you meet people, knives get built, you start using them and, um, and that's the way it really is. But in terms of the specifications of this blade you're looking at about 3.2 millimetres in thickness of the actual blade. The length of the blade is about 4.9 inches and the total length of the entire knife is 8.81 inches and you've got a 27 degree bevel there. It's around about a 1095 equivalent in terms of the steel and it's hardened to 59 to 60 on the Rockwell scale. So pretty hard, pretty tough blade with a decent tang length in it into a comfortable handle that you could use pretty much all day long. Mora do make other knives as well that if you don't have the budget for around 15 pounds or 16 or 17 dollars, this one here was five pounds and um, this here is a Mora 511, another carbon steel blade. It's about 2 mil in thickness, just over I believe. And you can see it has an unfinished spine there, so slightly cheaper in production. But again, a very useful knife. It reminds me very much of the Holtifers knives that I used to use a lot at work. The um, Holtifers Carbon Steel Craftsman. Again, an excellent knife, and you can buy that on Amazon for around about £3. Um, so might be worth having a look at their range as well. There's not a lot in them really in terms of difference and uh, they both make an excellent set of knives. It does come in a stainless option as well and stainless is, uh, is excellent if you're by the coastline. I wouldn't recommend stainless if you don't live by the coastline. I'd recommend to go with carbon steel just because it's a good all-rounder. It's very easy to work with good edge retention. But the stainless steel Mora uses is excellent as well and it's got a very good heat treat on it and um, just as good a edge retention in some respects as the carbon steel but I generally recommend a carbon steel to a beginner because it gets them used to looking after the blade and then later down the line you might move on to a more advanced stainless technology on a different style grind if you find yourself going down a certain path for example like dressing game or fishing or you don't find you're working with wood so much so it's good to start off with something like this because it teaches you all the core skills that go alongside looking after a knife maintaining it sharpening it bringing it back to life if you've abused it because you're new to using it and maybe using it in the wrong way for example and it's inexpensive as well so you can make those changes to it like grinding down the spine without really caring because if something goes wrong with it you can easily just buy another one if you break it. I think one of the main issues with people wanting to pick knives like this when they're getting into bushcraft is because they see people like me and other people out there practicing bushcraft skills and they've got something that looks really fancy, just like that. But the thing to understand is that the metal and, and the treatment behind the metal and the actual blade, there really isn't a lot of difference in it, if any at all. Um, companies like Mora have been making knives for a long time and their heat treat is very good and the, the, bla the quality of the steel is very good as well. The cost comes in hand making the knife that's that's where the cost comes from you know me saying i want a piece of you as a handle and i want a leather sheath that's hand stitched and i want the metal to be hand rubbed or forged this is where the cost comes in and i think when you've been doing bushcraft skills or you've been practicing outdoor living skills for a long time it's nice to have something sentimental like that to work with out in the field that you've had an input in designing to give it some personalization but the reality is you don't need things like that uh, we talked about full tang. Full tang is great if you're doing a lot of batoning and heavy processing with a knife or prying or standing on it or using it as a ladder to climb up trees which all those things are just in my in my 
opinion, they're not things I do with knives anyway. But if you're actually using a knife for its purpose and you're carving some wood and you're making some notches, you don't need full tang. A push tang or a rat tail tang is perfectly adequate. Um, it is perfectly adequate for you. It, it depends what you're using the knife for. It's what it comes down to. It's what you're using that knife for. I mean, if you carry an axe and you start getting into outdoor living skills and bushcraft skills, you'll find as time rolls on, the axe will become 80 to 90% of what you use all the time. And the knife will do very, very little. And you will realize that you don't need, um, you know, this, this knife has all the bells and whistles on it. You just need a little knife little three inch knife to do some carving and whittling with and the axe can kind of do it all. So this is why it's really important just to start out with something basic and, and find your feet and let the, the, the avenues grow as you explore different skills and um, you'll start to really understand you know, what knives will do what for you and you'll have a bit of an input later on down the line in what kind of knife you want and be able to influence that decision if you do have one handmade for you. But don't worry about the coolness factor, that it's plastic and it has a plastic sheath. It just means you'll be laughing when you go canoeing and you fall in the river and your knife gets wet and the guy next to you has his posh leather one with wood on it and it gets totally ruined and the leather's soaked and you see him at the side of the river trying to wrap his knife in tissue and trying to dry it off and he can't put it back in the sheath till he gets home. That's the reality of it. So I hope this video's helped out. Just a video really to give you a bit of an introduction to knives. Some of these episodes in the series will be more complete than others, but that's because we will come back to knives later on in this series as we start to use them and as we move further on into the series and start to explore different things like processing game and all sorts of different tasks that you practice out in the field. And you'll see how different knives play a role out in the field and why they're useful. So I hope this video has helped out. I'll put links in the description to products like this if you are interested in checking them out. And thank you for watching and I will see you next week in episode 12 where we'll be practicing knife skills and looking at knife safety and actually using a knife properly out in the field. Thanks for watching and I'll see you real soon.